Uh, my name is Emily Capus, and I organized the exhibition. And um, this is our first first day of programs related to the show. Um, organizing the show was a, a complete privilege for me, and it was a fascinating lesson in our country's immigration history. I traveled to San Francisco, to Denver, um, and made new friends in the Chinese American community. Um, I consulted with the local Suncoast Association of Chinese Americans, and one of their board members, Quinn Shea, translated the entire exhibition into Chinese. So when you see it, is he here? I think he, he, might, he might be coming. Um, he did a wonderful job and uh, consulted also as well on the content and the editing for the show and was a huge help to me as I navigated this topic that was, that was pretty new for me. Um, I've been thinking about this show for a little uh, more than two years and my thoughts have been swirling around it and it's an exciting weekend. And what I hope for visitors when you go upstairs is that you feel the sense of celebration of, of culture, of such rich culture and history um, that I intended. Um, the paintings in the James Collection were certainly a uh, foundation for the show, um, but I expanded with a lot of loans to other ins for institutions, and um, I'm so grateful for all of those. There were 10 different lenders for the show. Um, but one section of the gallery is dedicated to the work and story of Chinese American painter Z.S. Liang. He's one of Tom and Mary James's favorite artists, with 23 major paintings in the collection. You, you might be familiar with the three that are currently on view in the Native Life Gallery, uh, but there's 11 more that are new in the exhibition that you'll see. He's one of the strongest and most accomplished painters of Native American history, and we're so grateful that he and his wife, Lee, have joined us from California for this celebratory weekend. I'll read a brief bio, but Z.S. can explain his story best. In 1953, Z.S. Liang was born in the city of Guangzhou, the capital of Guangdong province in southern China. He was raised in a family of artists. Becoming a professional painter was a natural direction for him, though he would discover his choice of subjects on the other side of the world, here in the United States. For the last 20 years, Liang has focused on painting Native American history and narratives based on his respect for indigenous cultures here in his adopted country. The selection of paintings in the exhibition exemplifies Liang's technical skill and visual storytelling. He studied at the Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing and Guangzhou Academy of Fine Arts. Liang furthered his studies here in America starting in 1982. He earned a BFA in painting at Massachusetts College of Arts in 1986 and his MFA in painting at Boston University in 1989. Liang received great inspiration in this country while studying and painting the Wampanoag Indian culture at the Outdoor Cultural Center in Plymouth, Massachusetts, and he'll be able to tell you all about that with some great pictures, I'm sure. Uh, Liang is represented by Legacy Galleries in Scottsdale, Arizona, and his works are in the collections of the National Portrait Gallery, of the Autry Museum of the American West, uh, the West Point Museum, Harvard University, and here at the James. Welcome, Z.S. Liang. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and the committee of the Tom Museum, Tom James Museum. Uh, thank you for giving me such a great opportunity to present my work and tell you the story how I start American Indian painting. Two days ago, I came from California. I was very humid here. <laughs> and, uh, was, Oh, the surprise. I hope right now everybody's comfortable in this room. Uh, and sit here. And I hope uh, I try to make it as interesting as possible. So I make sure nobody will go to sleep. <laughs> when I came over from Guangzhou, China, in 2000, <clears throat> actually in 1982, uh, that was a very different world in China from what we see today. But uh, after I, I spent 
20 years in Boston, and I spent another 20 years in California. And I changed a lot and learning so much about the, the West, about American culture, and especially 40 years ago when I started to learn American Indian culture. Um, I will start to tell the story from my father's work. And that's his, one of his print, woodcut prints. He, he was a woodcut artist, and he spent a lot of time during World War II in southern China, and uh, created a lot of artwork and woodcut prints, especially uh, focused on the World War II. And, but this piece was done in, after the China just established, and it reflects the movement, you know, building the new country and the railroads on the countryside, and that just gives a good sample of the new development in China. And that's my father. <laughs> and my mother and my father. Okay, that is in the earlier work. Um, in, I think it's in 1930s, 35, um, he did a whole series about the Japanese invasion um, in the countryside, and um, as you can see, I'm making the temple as the station. And people start to fight back. And also, he did a lot of work about the railroad and the steam engines. Okay, in that time, he has a great opportunity to meet an American woman, Pearl Bach. I don't know how many of you will remember her. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, she's a uh, uh, winner of the Nobel Prize uh, in the literature. And when she, uh, in that time, she was in Chongqing, and my father also is in Chongqing. That was the capital the China in the World War II. And she met my father and, and she saw my father's work and asking him if she can purchase some of his prints. And uh, they eventually they got eight pieces and the crow part of an interview asked every piece uh, what's going on in every piece. And eventually she collect a th 1, 000, not 1, 100 30 pieces print, woodcut print to put that uh, in a book called uh, Black and White in China and published in American. And that's the first time my father's work and reach out and you know, people in America can see his, uh, not his work and another artist's work in that time. And this is one of the pieces in that book. And uh, my father was very appreciate uh, this opportunity. Um, okay, <laughs> I gotta make it very quick. And um, this is another lady I met in the fa in my, our family. That's the American lady I met when, in my age, when I uh, graduated from college in China. That's a <clears throat> Cohen, Mrs. Cohen. I think many artists in that time in China know this lady. 
uh, her husband was invited, was hired by the Chinese government as an international lawyer to help China to establish the international law. And she, Mrs. Cohen was a professor of um, School of Fine Art, of, of Museum of Fine Art in, in Boston. And when she was in China, and she asked the government to give an opportunity, if she had the opportunity to see the art and the students in China. And in that time, almost she can ask anything, the government will agree, because um, not many artists from America, not from outside the world, came to China. <coughs> So she has the pause, also <clears throat> she has the great opportunity to see all the students and hours in Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou. Uh, I was in Guangzhou at that time, and she not only wanted to see those under the government of, uh, organization, because the school belongs to the government, so she asked if she can see an art artist uh, they're not professional artists, maybe, but they're not in the school, just in the city, and the government agreed. So I was one of them. So I remember she, with the um, in Guangzhou, in the Guangzhou embassy, with the, um, I think that's, um, what's the that name? Anyway, they got the big um, minivan, like 15 of us, get into the van, they bring us to a restaurant, they said that invite us for dinner. It looks like a very secretary thing. So we are kind of a little bit nervous. <laughs> <laughs> because in that time, still the government is kind of nervous in what the outside people, what they're doing in China. But anyway, we have a very relaxed time and we have a dinner together and then she explained to us, and then they really want to see our work. And we set up another time, another weekend, so we can come to the hotel and where she stayed, and also in that time, the embassy, not embassy, um, the embassy in China, and the, the organization, Guangzhou. So that we suppose all bring our work to show, them, to show her, and she went to, I think in that time she was getting all the information, the right book about uh, the Chinese artist in that time of China. And I brought this one and that one. You saw that in the show. And I painted this in, I think, in the 1980s. Um, in this, especially in this piece, in that. It's kind of a self-portrait, and uh, I imagine myself and looking at the future of the China and all these sails down there, like a, all the Chinese people, like a waiting for a new movement to start, and and see the old dragon in that uh, the piece of uh, old. Um, something in the building, and I got that from the book, and, and that dragon start to fry again. Wow. And um, it's not exactly so portrait, but it's not me anyway. But it's imagine, <laughs> imagine this man is like an artist, and like all the young people in China, and because that time China is a very far behind compared to what we can see today. Um, so we have uh, so much imagination for our future and so much hope. And all this book and uh, written by Mrs. Cohen, um, and especially the last one with all the new, uh, young Chinese artists in that time, and put in the book and uh, Today, if you ask all the artists in, that, in our age, I mean, everybody will remember her name. Yeah. Okay.
and I have a book and send it to her. And you know, now it's like 90 years old, and for, almost like 40 years later. And, uh, and she sent me the photos, and I was very appreciate it. And when I came to the United States and I embraced modern art, I don't want to study realism painting, which I studied in China. Everything is new, and all the people in China, young artists in China, want to learn modern art, want to learn something different from the socialism, or like a propaganda art. There's another piece uh, in Massachusetts College of Art at that time. And that's my graduation show. <laughs> <laughs> I think all the surrealism, I mean, not surrealism, the modern art anyway, I call it uh, exp um, abstract expressionism. And uh, I met my wife. And that time I was um, in uh, 1992. And um, I just read a very quick report from my family. <laughs> and then later I had two daughters. And uh, my older daughter, Allison, studied graphic art. And my younger daughter studied uh, linguistic computer science. And today they have their job is that uh, they can find the best job in this country, and so they are happy as I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, here's my tutor and my teacher, and also he's my uh, older brother's classmate in China. I have to present him here because, and that's in his studio behind him. Us, that's uh, his work. Wow. And he, <clears throat> I think he's one of the most, the best portrait painter in the world. Uh, right now he's living in uh, New Jersey and, <laughs> and doing many portraits <laughs> for the political leaders in the world and governors in the United States. That's the one of his work in painting Queen Elizabeth in the palace. And that's the work he done. And it's funny. And he told me during the portrait you know, process, Queen, the Queen Elizabeth asked him, I said, are you nervous painting this portrait for me? <laughs> she said, no. But if I paint him Mao, I will be very nervous. This <laughs> <laughs> is <just> true. <laughs> Did she laugh? <laughs> I guess. Um, um, that's the queen's husband. And this, um, yeah, you know, the, the owner of uh, uh, <coughs> the Alpine Eye or the, the Virgin L9. And there's a Chinese girl. And it's a portrait he did. The portrait, the, the way he paint, maybe you don't, I have to point it out, and people will see. It's a not like just a real reason painting. You see that the abstract patterns, what she created, and all this become like a flatten, it's not very three-dimensional. And I see this little teeny tiny shape. And it manage. And this portrait is a big, it's about this size. Um, 
and all this detail, he managed the shape. And uh, he said that he wants to paint. Two D and three D happening at the same time. So I learned a lot from him. And uh, next is my portrait. Before I paint an American Indian, I paint portrait. I have a portrait business. There's a professor from uh, Trinity College in Connecticut. And a politician in Washington D.C. Family mm -hmm. portrait. Yeah. As a retired general, uh, when I paint. He's in, working in the Boston Fire Department, and uh, but uh, he he said they told me uh, he was working in the uh, in that organization, the military, especially during the uh, new Korea power, new Korea weapons, and there's a uh, praying behind him in the office. He said, that's the print she fried. Uh, she said, it's the fattest, has the fattest speed in the world at that time. I, I believe so. Okay, this is my work, uh, some you know, figure work. And in a way, I because after painting all the abstract expressionism, abstract expressionism paintings in the school, I learned a lot about how to combine the abstract quality into my realism painting. Because this is after those paintings. And I couldn't make a living, by the way, I have to, have to tell you. After school, I couldn't make a living by doing all those more than our paintings. Mm -hmm. So I found a job in an uh, interior design company. So my first job is an uh, architectural artist mm -hmm. for that company. What I'm doing is, uh, is the renderings, putting all the design together, and paint a watercolor. So that is a real reason uh, work. Mm -hmm. but <clears throat> and later I found is I can find my way doing, still doing kind of like a realism work and with some kind of abstract quality putting inside the painting. So here you can see, uh, yeah. this kind of very, it's not very clear, not very realistic, but has the big shapes and shapes and kind of separate the body in here, there's a light, and the head is like one punch, and then there's another big bra. Um, and there's a little punch, little tube punch here, and another one. When I say punch, because I can separate the shape from the big figure. Um, so that's how I'm doing in that time. But still, very difficult to to make a living in this in, in this country. So after I worked in a couple of years for the company, I find another job as a portrait painter. So I opened my own studio, the Van Studio, and doing portraits for retirement, like a CEO or, or the professors and. Okay, after that time, I think it's in 2001, I have uh, one opportunity to see the Indian. There's a very unexpected chance, like driving through Highway 90. 
I stopped by a rest area. And inside the building, there's a poster. Uh, one side is a pilgrim, and another side is an Indian. And a pilgrim man holding a gun, and another side, an Indian, is holding uh, a bow and arrows. And I found it very interesting. I asked the man working inside the rest area. And, uh, and, she's, and then she told me about the, the show, and about how, you know, this, more, more information in the poster. So I went to see the show, and I went to see the museum called the Plantation. I guess you know, some of you have already been there. And the Plantation, the big portion is the, for the 17 houses for the Plantation, and the pilgrim you know, working there. And another side of the museum, called the Outdoor Museum, is the Wampanoag. And inside the museum here, I saw my first Indian. And I did not expect anything at that time, but I, when I saw the poster, I just wanted to go here to see. But I, and then I saw the man in the poster. In that outdoor museum, there's a big dugout uh, canoe, and building houses, no people, there's a park and weaving all you know, the baskets. And that's the man I met. And when I saw him, I said, wow, this, I said, it's a very interesting. And very quickly, if something come to me, I, I just want to paint him. So I asked him, I said, oh, I, can you be my model? <laughs> 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 and, uh, and he said, uh, I said, sure, but not today. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he told me he's very knowledgeable about the, uh, the Wampanoag culture. And, uh, and he has many jobs besides the museum, you know, working, the mu work, working for another museum, and terror stories, and dancing, and all of that. So I, immediately I, I became very interesting. I said, uh, yeah, sure. And, uh, I said that the ne maybe next weekend I can come over. I said, yeah, sure. And um, then next weekend I came and he got all the weapons and outfits and all the things uh, he needs. And then they asked me, you know, what, what do you want to see? I said, I have no idea, but they just tell me. <laughs> uh, what do you do as an Indian man in the old days? And then very quickly he said, okay, first thing I can tell you about a hunter. Hunting is a big thing for Indian, you know, to support the family, food, and um, also, you know, hunter also is a warrior, you know, to protect the families. So very quickly, then I have a backpack and I said, okay, I tell you what, you put your backpack, it's like 20 meters away. Then uh, they said, I will start from here and try to find the deer you know, very, very slowly you know, through the woods. And then he said, now I see the deer and there is watch me. How do I approach and how do I shoot? So in the whole process, I keep taking hundreds pictures. Um, eventually, the deer is down, which in my backpack is there, and he said, I will put tobacco around the body and putting my hand above the heart. He said, when the deer is shoot by the arrow, it won't pass away, right? You no, know, won't pass right away. It takes about 20 minutes, half hour, I said, oh, okay. And then he said, one hand I can feel the heart beating, and then another hand holding the tobacco and saying prayer and transfer their spirit back to Mother Nature. I then all this is, oh, wow, that's awesome. <laughs> and I can, I can imagine my paintings right away. I said, wow, oh, what the painting can be in this. So I, different angles and took a lot of pictures. So 
after that, and he showed me more about how Turkey is in you know, leather things, built houses, and all like that. But more of my mind's focus is for hunting a deer. Yeah, that is what I just told you. And that's my painting. Uh, I just found this fascinating. And then the Indian culture. Um, because, by the way, Indian for us, I know, it's, it's kind of a relative. Because I know 20,000, 30,000 years ago, the immigrant from the coast of Berlin uh, Ocean, and that time was frozen. And there's uh, so many different time from different places, from Asia, the immigrant to the United States and go to South America and then go back and stay in the North America. So that's a turkey, hunter, too. His name is a woman. This woman of man is a reader. And that's another painting I did across the bridge around the area. And I saw that spot. I said, wow, what happened in that spot if I stand here? What can I see? I can imagine an Indian catch water, to drink the water. So I have this piece done right from my imagination. And the title is a Sweet Water. So you saw that lady in that outdoor museum weaving. So I create my own. Okay, after that, because uh, only knowing the Wampanoag, and I don't know anything about the India in the United States. I kept talking to people and friends, and I really want to learn that how can I get to know somewhere else. And I know there's many Indians. And then I got the answer. I said, go to the library. You know, this, you know, get this book. And so I got a whole bunch of books and kept re reading. I spent like the first um, three, four months just reading the book and just keep learning and learning. I found there's a 500 tribes in the United States, but some of them very small, and some of them are huge, like Lakota, Cheyenne, and Crows, Blackfeet, and so, and all of a sudden, like, I opened up, and I saw the pictures of these tribes for the Wampanoag, because they were wiped out, I think, in 1660. Because when, they, when the, the pilgrim, uh, when the Mayflower you know, set the anchor and the you know, up, 40 years later, more white people coming and pushing the Wampa, not only the Wampa, all the Indian, pushing and pushing and more fight and more fight. So in, the 16, uh, in 1661, and that's the first war between the white people and the Indian, called the Philip War. And that was the Massasoit, the chief, after 40 years, the chief's son. There's a fight with, uh, I think that's the biggest battle in that time. And he was killed, and his head was put in the spear and put in the center of the square in Boston for 15 years. And after 15 years, I think it's kind of thing crashed and fell. So I learned that, but those are no photos. I can see everything is from reading. But in this book, and showing all, because in the 1850, we started to have a camera. And very quickly, the camera applied to the Indian, they record many great pictures. So through these books, I saw many 
great photos. I said, wow, Oscar, that's an Indian. What happening in the 80s, in, in 19th century, especially in 18, from 1850 to 1875. In that time, there's a lot of fighting and conflicts. Um, so after reading this book, and I said, oh, OK, I, I have to go to the West. I have to find out, and I want to see more about the Indian. And I want to see the places they have a war. I try to make it quicker because I can see the time. <laughs> I try to make it not more than one hour. Okay? <laughs> and uh, I, I need to tell you, this, um, this man comes over. I, I met him. I, I, I saw the magazine. The magazine, Art West, every two months, is, is a two months magazine. And every issue, they get to present one artist's studio. And I saw the studio behind him, is all the artifacts and our Indian outfits and wrappings. I said, wow, I really want to see this man. Because I really want to learn. I said, if I can meet him, I will learn a lot. So I asked people eventually, through three people, different connection. I find him and write to him. I send my work to him. I said, I saw the report and then not in the in the magazine. I really want to meet you, and I want to learn from you. And this is my work. And so after that, then he saw my work. You know, in the letter, I said, Oh yeah, yes. If you want, if you can come over. I have a guest room for you. I said, oh really? <laughs> and you live in Montana in the Caspell. So we met and very quickly become great friends. And uh, he said, uh, I really want to learn from you. And I said, I really want to learn from you. Said, okay, we'll teach each other, we can learn from each other. And he showed me many uh, places, historical sites. Uh, and I just keep learning and learning and got inspiration about what I'm going to pay for my painting. Mm -hmm. And that's a painting, uh, Katrina maker, and that's a Hopi, Hopi man. And I, I met a Hopi man actually, and asked him about the Katrina, and I read a book about Katrina because they're so interesting. Every piece this doll represent a different spirit for their life. And uh, the one in here, there's a God for them. And it, although it looks really funny, like you see the face, you don't see eyes, you don't see anything, but uh, in their way, he is overwhelmed by everything. And people watch him. And all this is for seeds and corns and uh, squash and you know, everything, everyone's representing something. And I have a, a drawing of a Katrina maker. And I found a real Hopi Machina, Katrina maker. I showed that to him. I, I researched him and then I contacted him eventually. I, I met him in the uh, Hopi reservation and showed him the drawing. I said, can you tell me, is there anything wrong or is there something you want to, I need to change? And he said, no, you're doing pretty good, but uh, this should be here, this, that should be that. So, and that eventually I got this done. Uh, and that's the show I have this painting in Orchard Museum. And I remember, I don't know how many of you know, Howard Turpin, uh, a great painter, painting the, um, <clears throat> the American Indian, and uh, and I talked to him. I said, and he said, "Wow, you have this great piece, and I, I really want to buy it." And he said, "Okay." In that time, in the 
uh, Orchard Museum at the opening. There's a box. Anyone want to buy? You have to put the, your ticket there. And eventually, he did not get it, but anyway. Oops. Uh, and that's another big piece. I think it's like 42 by 72, something like that. Uh, this is a highway 66 across that, that area, that town. And, um, and those Indians you know, making those potteries, I have to point out this. And especially got the deer in the house. And also what they have here is an owl. Um, so these visitors coming from this tourism car, uh, there's a small car coming, um, and they're just fascinating by what they see here. And I suppose this lady, young lady, is an elementary school teacher. <laughs> uh, that time, my, my two daughters you know, attending the school, and I very often I met the teachers. And the teachers are so nice. I'm so touching. And it such, gives us such love to the children. And I suppose and this would be the elementary school teacher. <laughs> and so she so gives empathy to this family, and our little brother you know, behind, and holding a bone and trying to get the dog. and. The younger sister, you know, looking and trying to get her to buy this pottery. The funny thing is, when I have this posing, this you know, modeling for this painting, my older daughter, Alison, I suppose just met, met her to stay there, and my younger, I mean, and my this lady was uh, elementary school teacher and staying this way, and they kind of. And my younger daughter Sarah said, Eddie, where I stand? <laughs> oh, I did not prepare for that. But I cannot say it. Get away. <laughs> I said, oh, okay, come over. Let's just stand here. <laughs> so eventually I found that's a better composition and better painting. And that's. Um, uh, I suppose there's a Wampanoag uh, Indian in that time. And uh, in this painting, basically, I suppose before the white man came, because nothing is got from the white people in this piece. It can be like 500, it can be 1,000 years ago, and the Indians just like that. So for me, like son of nature, and as for the painting. <coughs> well, that's uh, the title of this painting. is called a rope deer, and that showing the, the all these uh, the hunters or warriors, and uh, they woke up in the morning in the village. And they found the big mass, a lot of things are damaged by bear. And they, they see, they can sense the bear is not so far from the village. So they try to catch the bear. And also the hunter. And the hunter facing a bear in this painting. And this is a life and death situation. And okay, this is a Lakota. Um, they call it the lost powder horn. Oops. And the fire. And in this little space, and they have a, um, I think they're cooking the milk. Um, 
and these hunters, and they saw the Indian coming, and they you know, just tried to escape. And so they when they came, they couldn't find them. But they saw this, saw the fire, and the lost powder horn. Okay, this is another big piece. Um, I after I learned a lot from Tom Sober and uh, and know the, the black feet has a rich culture and they record they has a four book on this stick about the um, hunting society and religion and daily life, everything in that book, four books on this stick. And I read through the book, I found one thing is the bear has a huge meaning for the black feet. They consider the bear is the brother. And, um, but funny thing is for us, we, at the beginning I have a hard time to understand how American people love something, but also can kill something, kill the same thing, and how that relate together. And then later I learned spirit and the actual body is two things. When they hunt the buffalo, because they love buffalo, right? Buffalo is the basic source, basic food for life. And uh, they said, God, give them this food to support them. And when you have the meat, you just give the thanks to God, and the spirit will return to Mother Nature. Said, okay, I understand that. So in here, the bear, that's the bear's jawbone, and we a tool coming out from there. And that beggar has a superpower for the Bradfi Indian, according to what I've read. There's a someone fighting in a battle, and all of a sudden, and pull out this beggar holding in the air. And that can paralyze the enemy. So, <laughs> that you can imagine how powerful is that dagger. But that dagger, it cannot just own by one person. He has the capability to you know, call people and fight and everything. But when he get old, he had to pass the, the dagger to a younger person. So here is the painting, the title is a transferring the bear type, um, bear knife. So all the medicine men and you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, head people in the tribe, they had to stay in this teepee to see. He has the flow of life to this new uh, person. If she, he can catch the knife, so he be okay to get the, continue this uh, heritage. But very often, the knife can hurt the people, hurt the person, and he's not qualified for the job. <laughs> and he suppose is naked. I, I put a little uh, wristcloth around him. <laughs> it looks a little bit better for me. Uh, but I just find this as fascinating in the graphic culture. And there's a one portrait. Looking for buffalo. I, I, just, I have a, so many paintings here, I just make it very quick. <laughs> and there's a Lakota, I'm trying to block the immigrant you know, from east to the west. A Bradley hunter. There's a Navajo lady. Okay, again, you can see the portrait, I, how to manage, because this is a big, you can see the detail, and how I manage the shade. 
Now all this is small opening here and big triangle opening here. And you see all this, even the teeny tiny string. You see the geometrical form. Um, and that's how I interested in the detail and all this. Not only try to make it like people say, ah, oh, the painting is so good, like a photograph. I say, oh, okay, thank you. There's <laughs> 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 a graphic mother and little kids. It's a winter, trading with the back feet. And you can see here, man's interesting, the, the arms, and the arms, guns, and this little boy looking at this gun. And someday, you can have one. <laughs> and the ladies, near interesting, all the ribbons, and you know, cooking, Potteries and jewelries and uh, and she's his wife, you know, the married a graphic lady, and she's helping him to do the sale. And this young man holding a blanket and looking at this girl, and it's a chief's girl and chief's daughter, and try to get her. And in the Indian way, you have to please the father. So the blanket is going to give the father. And the old lady uh, coming to see is oh, so interesting, this sales and things and never seen before. And helping by a granddaughter. Okay. Was a graphic chief, a Crow Indian. I met him in a Crow reservation, and uh, and he was sitting there. I look around and try to find good faces. But unfortunately, today when you go to the reservation, ninety-nine percent of the Indians are kind of heavy because the diet changed, and normal buffalo can uh, hunt, and they, what they eat is all the, you know, drink beers, and fry flowers, and drink coffees, and so, and they don't run too much like before, and so we, most of people get, just get heavier and get heavier. And finally, I saw this man sitting there's a uh, horse race in that time, in the reservation. And I saw him sitting there and watching. I said, wow, this is a great face. I, I need to ask him. And he was kind of a very serious and not very friendly. So I come over and explain myself and, and explain my you know, interests. And eventually, I said, okay. And he's just still sitting there, just take one, two, three. I took a three pictures from him, uh, and I paid. So when I got back from my studio, I said, look at it again, I said, wow, this is a great photo. And eventually, I got this portrait done. And there's a lava hole, blanket, showing to the younger kids, and the three generations here. Hunting, older man, older man. Okay, this is a grandpa tying the feather on the horse, and that means when they go out to hunt the buffalo, it's a dangerous work. If the horse step in one hole, in the prairie is a lot of animal on them digging holes, and if one small hole, the horse is going to get in. Uh, be toast because break the toe, break the neck means death. Uh, so grandma tying this 
uh, golden eagle, golden eagle feather uh, for his son, and also you know, the grandson is here and watching, and he is not qualified <laughs> for the hunting, but he's oh wow, something I can go with it. So this is the man like a leader, like a police, because the hunting buffalo you cannot go just by one person. All people have to move at the same time. So he's organized the hunt. And the lady is in here and get ready to purchase the buffalo. So it's a very you know, kind of busy environment in this case when people are getting ready and the buffalo is very close. Another portrait. Hunter. Oh, I see the, the chimney rock in Nebraska. And I, after reading all the you know, books and documents, and I found that uh, this is one trail from Carlson, and Mississippi River, and all eventually to Oregon. And called the Oregon Trail. And when they, from 10 miles away, they can see that chimney rock is like big um, lighthouse. And they stop by here, and the Indians kind of waiting and trade their moccasin with what they have, the fabrics, cans, uh, teapots. So, and that's the piece called the uh, Trading Moccasins. That's the title of the painting. And there's the um, bare feet again. They came over here, and they not just, it's a long story. And Lewis and Clark, and, and that's the times 1803 or 1804, uh, when he returned from you know, the ocean back to St. Regis, I'm not saying, um, to the west, to the east anyway. They passed this area and they have only one fight with the Indian in this three years trip. And um, before the, this morning and they settled with I think there's a seven Indian, graphic Indians. And they sit down and you know, burning buffalo meat and drinking and try to try to create harmony and try to convince the Indian you know, they come no harm and good blah 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 and everything seems okay but the middle of the night one of the Indian notice the gun they have and try to steal the gun and eventually the big crowds and then People woke up and he tried to get a gun running. And I think it's Louis and behind them, and eventually I killed two Indians. And after that, they, I think five of them they escaped and give a report. And this, the people coming back to try to get them. And then in that, this area, they did call the two medicines. And the, there's a one river called the Two Medicine River. And we climb up to here, Tom Sobert with me. And I'm standing on this rock. I close my eyes. I, can, I just feel like I can feel these people around me. I can see them. Um, and that's how later I have this painting. And these people come back here, try to find them. But they're already gone far away. I, I had to make it very quick, and there's a crow Indian, you know, and uh, weaving or making the, this uh, suitcase and uh, eagle feather. I have this man. Actually, he did this dance in my backyard. <laughs> I, I met her in a power, and then I asked him, I said, wow, I said, you have a great dance, and can you come to dance for me? 
<laughs> and he said, yeah, because of course I show my work to him, and, and he understands. So I have this great well, photograph from him, and so eventually I paid this painting. And there's a crow. Uh, this is crow people. I, one thing I want to point out, interesting, you see this man, is a cooking, and this is a buffalo stomach. When people do not have a metal, or no pottery, how, they, how do they cook? Soup. The burning the meat is not enough. They want to something like a soup. And that's what they have. Burning the rock, red hot, and then use that stick and put the red hot rock into the stomach and make a soup. So I found this very interesting. So that up in there, this is a people, you know, teaching the younger boys and making arrows and grandma making, you know, dolls for girls. And, and, and what happened here is a little emperor, emperor and they cut, they cut him as a little baby. And I think right now is like one year old and he's meeting a new friends. And try to make this more interesting for the crow, um, for the crow village. So Wombanov, well, this is uh, the colder after the war, little bit home. Catch water, trading, harvest, uh, Huckleberry, mm -hmm. and it's the first time they have a chance to touch the girl's hand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you understand what's going on after this. <laughs> <laughs> There's a buffalo dance. Okay, this piece is in the, yes. in the museum, you can see. And everything here, and you know, the wolf is dancing, running around. And this person behind him, and the jump, jump, and people fighting. And this is uh, calling the buffalo, come over. And uh, in this time, the buffalo is still far away, and people couldn't wait any longer, and people need food. And that uh, the buffalo dance. And this is uh, any the opposite tribes. But this lady keep trying to make people come, peace, don't fight, don't fight, nobody listen. Mm -hmm. So that's after the attack, and all people left, and he was injured and left behind. And this lady found him, and said, don't worry, I help you. And eventually, she went back and tell the chief what happened, Three, four months later, uh, they come back here and was gift, and then they make a peace, and now everybody become a good ally. And as, that's the kind of story what we need in this world and what happened. Yes. Yes. You know, yes. Yes. Let's make it very quick. And also, that's the back feet, and this man showing the shoe to to him. That this is a great and. Because the medicine man looking at that, so, yeah, this is a great shoe, but not useful for us. Because we need the shoe like this. You have to understand, you have a dream, and you have to tell the dream to the medicine man, and the medicine man gives you an explanation, and then eventually you hire someone to make the shoe, and then they make it. Uh, people will sing and dance and make a change for the spirit into the shoe. So the shoe then have uh, the power to protect the person. And this shoe, it looks pretty, but useless. <laughs> I got to very, very quick because of one hour already. <laughs> There's a crazy horse. You can see this in the show.
Mr. Cook, I have. Oh, I have stopped here. And this, I think, is a great story. Uh, he, there was a more than more than a thousand people fighting in the battle. And this medicine man tried to stop them. And and he has this a holy rattle, and he believe people listen to this will come down and not fight. And he really believed that he keep singing and keep shaking the battle, shaking the rattle through the battle, and people shoot him. No effect. You see the arrows not flying. And eventually, he did stop the war. And I, I read the book, and I found this, wow, I think this is really interesting. I, I imagine that's what <laughs> maybe you can see in the battle. And that, actually, that's in Canada. And after I read the story, I went to Canada, to this area. Um, and it's very open, there's no trees in the hill. And so the clouds passing on, you can see the shadow on the ground. I found this very interesting. Okay, I just very quickly is showing some of my work here. Oh, the sitting bow. I think most of the people do not do not know sitting bow. In 1885, we went to Philadelphia. We saw a lot of young kids and the beggars, and we got the money by the. Um, his uh, signature, and people pay him, I think it's one dollar in that time, and they give most of, most of the money to the kids. The medicine bundle, chief meeting, horse, when they go out to steal the horse, the medicine man have this special uh, settle on the ground. So we can help the people to get the horse. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's the last piece. Okay, that's my studio. Yeah. One side and another side. Yeah. I have a three windows, two-story high building, and three windows. The light coming from my left. I think this is the last piece of the slides, and thank you so much for coming to my show. And